This is the day that the Lord has made. We shall rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome to McCormick Theological Seminary uh, annual HIV AIDS Summit hosted by the uh, Center for African American Ministry and Black Church Studies. We say welcome and we say thank you for joining us on this day and during these unique and strange times um, as we navigate uh, all the complexities of this pandemic. Um, one thing we are seeking to do over at McCormick is to ensure that we do not allow the pandemic to impede upon our progress around education and awareness and impacting the community at large. At this time, before we move forward with our program, we invite you to go to the Lord with us in prayer. Let us pray. God, we come this morning giving you thanks and giving you praise for yet another day to be alive. We thank you, O oh God, for uh, just being who you are and for the many ways that you continue to bless us. And now, God, we invite you into our summit, into worship, and into every aspect of our program. We ask, O oh God, that you would have your will and your way, and that, God, that that you would allow everything that is said and done to be pleasing in your sight. Now we thank you in advance for all that you will do on this day. We offer this prayer in the matchless and the mighty name of Jesus as we all say together, amen. Amen. At this time, the president of McCormick Theological Seminary will come forth to give us greetings and to introduce uh, all those persons who are participating in our worship, President David Crawford. Good morning. Thank you, Reverend Stacy. Uh, on behalf of our students, faculty, staff, and trustees, it is my honor to welcome you to this extraordinary annual event. First, may I ask you to join me in expressing gratitude to the driving force behind this gathering, the Reverend Dr. Stacy Edwards Dunn. Reverend Stacy, thank you for everything you do. And of course, our thanks to Reverend Priscilla Rodriguez, who along with Barbara Fassett and our IT team makes all of this magic happen. Thank you, Priscilla. Thank you, Barbara. Allow me please to extend a special thank you and welcome home to our guest preacher, Reverend Dr. Marcus D. Cosby, senior pastor at Wheeler Avenue Baptist Church in Houston, Texas. Dr. Cosby grew up here in Chicago and attended a seminary just down the road a bit. Not sure how we lost you to the Northern Baptist, but we are grateful you are here with us today and hope you will think of McCormick as your seminary home away from home. To Dr. Stefan Wallace, who will provide a biomedical update, to Dr. Kareem Watson, our panel moderator and our panelists, Dr. Burley, Dr. Searcy Pate, thank you all for being with us and thank you for all of the important work you do. A year ago, we gathered in our common room as we typically would for last year's HIV AIDS Summit. And here today in what would have seemed most uncommon then, we gather in our now familiar Zoom boxes. For many of you who have been on the front lines of the battle against HIV AIDS, this current pandemic and our often incoherent national response to it are no doubt disheartening, but not surprising. Systemic racism, inequality, indifference, and ignorance contributed to the spread of HIV AIDS as it has again with COVID-19. As I imagine we might hear more about today, the world's focus on COVID-19 will likely have some negative impacts on the progress made to control the spread of HIV AIDS. According to data from the United Nations, the lockdowns and border closures imposed to stop COVID-19 are impacting both the production of antiretroviral medicines and their distribution, potentially leading to increases in their cost and to supply issues. Recent modeling has estimated that a six month complete disruption in HIV, HIV treatment could lead to more than 500,000 additional deaths from AIDS related illnesses. Friends, there is much, much work to do and we are grateful for the important you work your work every day uh, to fight HIV AIDS and for being with us today. So again, thank you to you all. And again, welcome to McCormick Theological Seminary. Thank you, President Crawford for that powerful, powerful, um, uh, those words of greetings and just introduction um, to this year's summit. 
And um, we just thank and praise God for you and your continued work that you do, how you serve at McCormick Theological Seminary. You are the best president um, uh, across this country, and we are so glad that you are our president at McCormick. At this time, um, our media department is preparing um, us to forge forward in worship, and we invite you at this time to prepare your hearts and your minds and your spirits for worship on this day. God's love never fails. He'll never leave us, don't forsake us. That's his word. But more importantly, God will pursue us to the ends of the earth. His love is what Rome would call reckless. He'll go to the ends of the earth for you. For I spoke a word you were singing over me. You have been so, so good to me. For I took one breath, you breathe your life to me. You have been so, so kind to me. Still you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Lord, you love me. I'm so grateful. Yeah. I can't imagine my life without you. your fault, still your love fought for me. You have been so, so good to me. When I felt no worth, you paid it all for me. You have been so, so kind to me. Leaves a ninety-nine. I don't deserve it. I could not earn it. Still, you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Lord, you love me. Yeah, you pursue. Shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. Yeah. There's no wall you won't kick down. Lie, you won't tear down coming after me. Oh, snow shadow, you won't light up, mountain, you won't climb up coming after me. My God, snow wall, you won't tear down. Lie, you won't tear down coming after me. My God, there's no shadow, you won't light up, mountain, you won't climb up. Slow. 
God be the glory for the great things our God has done. What a joy it is for me to greet you, McCormick Theological Seminary community, on this Saturday morning as you share together in this experience of HIV AIDS Summit. And I'm so grateful that clergy and lay have been brought together as the leadership of this community to participate in this dialogue and experience throughout this day that will help us to encourage brothers and sisters either infected or affected with HIV AIDS, by HIV AIDS. I'm grateful that I have the opportunity to share with you at the beginning of this summit as you prepare for the hours that will help us to be more educated and encouraged as we move throughout these days, weeks, and months that are ahead of us. President Crawford, God bless you, sir. Thank you so much for allowing us this space and opportunity. To Dean Davidson, I honor you and the work that you do at McCormick Theological Seminary. To my dear friend of many years, Dr. Stacy Edwards Dunn, God bless you, ma'am. Thank you for the wonderful privilege that you've afforded me to share in this experience. I am honored by the invitation. I do not take it lightly. I know that this summit is significant in the life of the Center for African American Ministry and Black Church Studies. And so I'm delighted to be a part of it. And I thank you so much for the opportunity. As we begin today's experience, as we share in conversation, I'm intrigued by the moment in which we find ourselves. I'm intrigued by the situation in life in which each of us has been into which each of us has been thrust. For these few moments that I spend with you today, I want to talk from a unique subject. I want to talk from the subject, that's not what I prayed for. That's not what I prayed for. I, I know all of you who are church historians, or theologians, and Bible scholars are very familiar with that passage of scripture in the New Testament when Jesus speaks to the Apostle Paul who has made inquiry of him and in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 at verse 9 Jesus says to Paul my grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in weakness Paul made inquiry of the Lord Jesus and when he got his response, <laughs> this is how 2 Corinthians chapter 12 at verse 9 reads, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. We come to today's summit in a way that is unique and different from every other summit the center has ever held. We're virtual. Many of us have grown accustomed to this new reality. I still call it the new abnormal. This is not something I choose to get used to. I'm, I'm standing in the nearly empty sanctuary of our church. And each week I have to preach to cameras instead of congregants. This is abnormal. This year has been a doozy, hasn't it? <laughs> Oh, yes, we've had to deal with the reality that a pandemic has imprisoned us. A president has embarrassed us. 
and protests have awakened or reawakened us to the reality that we do not live in a post-racial society. It's been a doozy this year. And in the midst of all of that, we come together in this virtual space to recommit our time and our attention to sisters and brothers living with what I have chosen to call for these preaching moments, the thorn of HIV AIDS and their families and their loved ones who likewise have to accompany them on the journey. This is the story of the Apostle Paul, a thorn in his flesh, some unknown, undescribed malady or disease or infirmity. We, of course, as we have done our studies, have never been able to pinpoint exactly what it was, but we know it has something to do with his physicality because Paul self-describes it as a thorn in his flesh. Permit me to use the metaphor today of this thorn with regard to this disease about which we speak and this conference, this summit to which we have been summoned and deal with the reality of a thorn. What does a thorn do? It aggravates, it agitates, it irritates, it makes you ruminate, makes you think about things in a different way. It, it makes you process things. That's what thorns do, I submit. I submit that they make us think there is this something from which I can get no swift relief. And I suggest today that they may even do more than that. Hear me now as I speak to you from the perspective of the Apostle Paul who gives to us in chapter 12 his testimony that he had to deal with the reality that there was something in his flesh, some challenge with which he had to deal and he needed the relief that could only come according to his autobiographical statement from the God to whom he prayed. And so he prayed that this thorn would be taken away from him. And God said to him, my grace is sufficient. The Lord Jesus responds to him by saying, my strength is perfected in weakness. My strength is on fuller display in weakness. He says, I prayed, watch the text if you will, that the Lord would take this thorn from me three times he prayed so says the scriptures he prayed three times and Jesus responds my grace is sufficient now I know that we who have been in the church community we who have studied the scriptures get excited about the business of grace and we should and I'll get excited I'm sure before this message is over about the reality of grace it is a wonderful thing but if we read the scriptures carefully my beloved we will find out that's not what Paul prayed for. <laughs> Paul did not pray for a dose of grace. Paul did not pray that the Lord's power would be perfected in his weakness. Paul's prayer was, take the thorn away. Remove from me this issue. Remove from me this malady. But that's not what happens and that's not what happens to many of us who have to deal with the thorny realities of life. And sometimes we do not have a quick relief, a swift release from the circumstances, the situations that plague us. Sometimes we have to live with it. Sometimes we have to endure it. Sometimes we have to go through the experience and never be released from it. And I submit today that, that sometimes the thorns of our lives have been given to us, have been placed in our lives. We have to deal with the situations. First of all, may I suggest to develop our dependence upon the divine, to develop our dependence upon the divine. Remind yourself again, my friend, who's doing the speaking here. This is Paul, the apostle Paul, this great leader of the Lord's church. This is the apostle Paul. We don't expect if we're just being honest about it, we don't expect Paul to be in this thorny predicament. He's Paul. 
Yeah, we know Paul, his pedigree, his pedagogy, and his prestige. We know Paul is a big baller shot caller, to use the vernacular. He's somebody special in the, in the reign and rule of God. He's somebody that people look up to. He's Paul, the apostle Paul. And Paul has to deal with the reality that he's in a thorny situation. He's in a circumstance he did not anticipate. He did did not want to be in. He comes from good stock. He's gone to good schooling and he's a servant of God and he still has to deal with this thorn in his flesh. He loves the Lord with his whole heart. He's sold out for God. He is a great evangelist, a pastor, a church leader. And he has to deal with a thorn. Sure, you and I may have some problems with some of his theology, if we'll be honest about it. But you can't deny that he's on the battlefield for the Lord. He promised the Lord that he would serve the Lord. And he has done so diligently, dutifully, and he still has to deal with this thorn. There are those in our churches, in our seminaries, yes, even in our families that, that have this same testimony, that have to go through the reality that despite how much they love the Lord and are sold out for the Lord, they still have to deal with this aggravation. This irritation with the thorny reality of life. They have to process it and you will do much of that today. How do we encourage? How do we educate? How do we edify these who have to perpetually deal with the thorny reality of life? And I submit today, brothers and sisters, that this reality can make us develop our dependence upon the divine. If you've read chapter 12, you already know that at the beginning, Paul is doing a lot of boasting. As a matter of fact, it does not begin at chapter 12. Paul begins at chapter 11 doing a lot of boasting with regard to who he is and what he has done and what he has accomplished, how much he has had to endure even for the cause of Christ. Paul has had to go through a whole lot and he says, I could boast about all of the things that I've had to endure. I could boast about all of the hardships that I've had to endure for the cause of Christ. As a matter of in fact, at chapter 12, he says, I can even boast about my revelations, about my visions. Oh, Paul is a super spiritual brother. So spiritual is he. He says he was caught up in the third heaven. We don't even know where that is. He's caught up in the third heaven and he sees things that others don't see. He experiences things that others don't experience. He says, even if I told you, you wouldn't be able to comprehend it. And if we're not careful because we've gone to the right schools and because we come from the right stock and because we're servants of the Lord we may think that we're handling this life all by ourselves and sometimes thorns push us to the place where we recognize that our own humanity is insufficient to, in, in, to endure all of the circumstances that life brings about and brings into our lives and so my friends we have to develop our dependence upon the Lord. I grew up right there in Chicago at Emmanuel Baptist Church, 8301 South Damon Avenue, Chicago, Illinois, 60620, where the Reverend Dr. L.K. Curry was my pastor. And it was there that I developed my love for the hymns of the Lord's Church. And I love that hymn, I Need Thee. Oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee. Oh, bless me now, my Savior. I come to thee. And all of us, my dear friends, will come to some moment in life where our schooling where the stock from which we come and even our service in the Lord's church will not suffice for the circumstance that we have to endure then it is then that we find greater dependence upon the divine and all of us who are listening to me right now have had those moments haven't we when we have to release ourselves from self-sufficiency and believe that there is a God who is able to handle the circumstances of our lives and life will press us into that place 
where all we can do is throw up our hands and say, I need thee, oh, I need thee every hour. I need thee. There's nothing like a thorn to make you acknowledge your dependence upon the divine. The last four years of the presidency have taught us that we have to depend on someone bigger than the government, on someone bigger than those elected to serve. We have to depend on someone bigger than police officers who are supposed to protect and serve. We have learned, haven't we, that there will be seasons where the aggravating and irritating and frustrating realities of life make us dependent upon the divine. I submit that a thorn ought move you to a greater sense of desire and dependence for the divine. Her name is Tiffany. She's a member of our church. She, like Paul, is an accomplished professional. But she told me that when they gave her her HIV diagnosis news, that none of her accomplishments mattered. None of her schooling could deliver her from the noise that invaded her mental space. But it moved her to the understanding that she couldn't handle it by herself. Thorns have a way of reminding us that no matter who we are, from whence we have come, no matter our scholarship, no matter our development in life, we still need a God who is on our side to enable us to move to the places in life where we seek to go, even if we have to deal with it with a thorn in our flesh. <laughs> More than a decade later, Sister Tiffany is now being honored this coming week for the work that she has done in HIV AIDS ministry. This coming week, she'll be honored on the television shows of our city because she allowed herself to learn how to depend more on her God, even and less on her own self-sufficiency. There's nothing like a thorn <laughs> to make you acknowledge your dependence upon the divine. I am grateful, my brothers and sisters, that Paul didn't necessarily get what he prayed for. I've been there where I, my personal self, had not have not received exactly what I prayed for from God. And I submit that sometimes that is so we might develop our dependence on the divine. But watch the text again. I prayed, says Paul, <laughs> that the Lord would take this thorn from me. But he said, my grace is sufficient. For my power is made perfect in your weakness. I like this. He got the answer to his prayer only because, watch, he had been praying. And I submit that sometimes a thorn, these thorny seasons, these thorny realities of our lives produce our persistence in prayer. Yeah, they not only develop our dependence upon the divine, but I submit that they produce our persistence in prayer. Notice the text, my friends. Read it when you have opportunity. He did not just pray once. He did not just pray twice. Your Bible is clear to help us to understand. He prayed three times for this King James Version. I know we don't use King James in the seminary, but old school King James Version says, I prayed thrice. I love the word. I prayed thrice that he would remove the thorn. And Jesus said, no, my grace is, but that's not what I prayed for. But the fact is, it made you pray. Yes, and friends, I come to this experience today to remind us that no matter how aggravating or irritating or frustrating the situations may be, there's something about thorny situations that move us to greater communication with our creator. And I submit that those of us who have been developed in the seminary, those of us who are leading both in clergy circumstances and in lay leadership, we need to understand we still cannot do this. We can't make the proper steps. We can't make the proper decisions without being persistent in prayer. Being persistent in prayer. No, prayer is not a panacea for every pain. I get that. Prayer is that agency through which we understand that we have circumstances that come into our lives that are bigger than who we are. And we need someone bigger than who we are to help us through it. And we have the opportunity to communicate with God. I love the reality of prayer. I remember what God said to the prophet 
Solomon, the preacher Solomon, as he stood in the temple dedicating that temple unto the Lord. Solomon asked, Lord, when your people come to this place, I want you to hear their prayer. I want you to affix a tune, rather, your ear to their prayer. And God says, listen, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. Oh, brothers and sisters, if ever we needed some prayer warriors, that's what we call them in the church, if ever we needed some prayer warriors, we need it now. Our land is sick. I mentioned to you the pandemic. I mentioned to you the protests. I mentioned to you the systemic racism that is pervading the streets and cities of, uh, of this nation, and we need praying people to heal the land. And when you have some irritating, aggravating, frustrating reality from which you can get no release, the good news is you don't have to handle it all by yourself. The wonderful thing about the scriptures is that the Bible says we can cast all of our cares on the Lord because the Lord cares for us. I love that. That, that Greek picture is that you can, as they say in Mississippi, from which my parents come, you can chunk your cares on God. That's, that's the picture that is given to us, that we don't have to handle it, be weighed down by it every day of our lives. We can cast, chunk, toss, to throw all of our cares unto a God who is able to bear it all. And you may have to do that more than once. There's someone who can testify. You've had to pray about the same situation more than than once and I came to encourage you don't be fooled by the bad news that says you're not supposed to pray more than once about a situation you don't have enough faith if you pray more than once no some circumstances will make you pray repeatedly some irritating aggravating circumstances will make you consistently talk to God it was a few years ago that we installed at our church a new telephone system Throughout the church campus, we installed new phones to ensure that we were all working with an updated telephonic system. I looked at all those buttons on my phone. I couldn't understand what all of those buttons meant. I, I had gone to the right schools, I thought. I knew certain things, I thought. But this phone had me boggled in the brain. And so I asked my assistant, what do all these buttons mean? I looked at one button that said, I see him call back. And she said to me, Pastor, when you are trying to call someone on campus and they're on their phone and they can't take your call at the moment, you can press I see him call back, hang up your phone, and your phone will continue to call the person you're seeking to, 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 to call until they're available for the conversation. I said, wait a minute, explain it to me again. Slow it down. Make sure I understand this. She said, Pastor, all you need to do when you can't get in touch with someone down the hall, someone in another building, just press ICM call back. And the phone has, has enough sense to keep calling that person until they are available for conversation. I said, my goodness, if my phone has enough sense to keep calling until it gets an answer, how much more should you and I keep calling until we're able to have conversation with the great creator of the universe who is able to remedy our situations? Oh, brothers and sisters, I came to inform you today that prayer still works. I know you know that. I know that's a part of your, your DNA. I know you've been th taught that for years and you may have taught it to someone else, but I want to encourage you on this Saturday morning that prayer still works. And you and I have to, in our irritating, aggravating, frustrating circumstances, produce a persistence in prayer that says, I will not judge, I will not let go. Until you bless my soul, until you give me some answer. But watch the answer. Because I submit that what Paul received was not what he prayed for. He prayed, watch, that the God to whom he was speaking would remove the thorn. And that God said back to him, my grace is sufficient for you because my power, my strength is perfected 
in your weakness. I submit today, my brothers and sisters, not only must we produce persistent prayer, not only must we develop our dependence upon the divine, but may I close my little message when I suggest to you that you and I, as people of God, need to cultivate our Christian character. That mm. sometimes the irritating, aggravating thorns in our flesh help us to cultivate our Christian character. There's a unique song that is sung in our faith tradition. It was written by Andre Crouch many years ago. And there's a little line that goes through the third stanza of the song. The stanza begins by saying, I thank God for my mountains. I thank God for my valleys. I thank God for the storms that God has brought me through. Watch. For if I never had a problem, I wouldn't know that God could solve them. I wouldn't know what faith in God could do. So through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus. I've learned to trust in God. Through it all, I've learned to depend upon God's word. Now, brothers and sisters, I've mentioned to you that prayer is not a panacea for every pain, that prayer helps us to have a conversation with one who is able to calm us down, get us off the ledge, and let us know that no matter what the circumstance, that he would be with us through it all. That's what Jesus says to him. Watch, my grace is sufficient for when you're weak, that's when I'm strong. When you get weak, God says, that's when I can make you strong. I can prove to you my strength. I was reading the book this past week. It's written by Dr. W. Franklin Richardson of New York. His new book is entitled Witness to Grace. And in that book, my brothers and sisters, Dr. Richardson says, grace is God being available and accessible. Mm. That blessed me that grace is God being available and accessible. Often we think of grace being all of the wonderful tangible things that are lavished upon us, heaped upon us. And no, Dr. Richardson says don't only think of grace as the tangible things or even some of the intangible things that you may enjoy. Grace is God being available and accessible. And I came today to encourage some brother, some sister that despite the frustrating, irritating, aggravating circumstances of our lives, God's grace is still sufficient. And Dr. Richardson says that grace is God's presence being available to us, knowing that we have access to the great God of the universe. No, I don't have all of the questions to the perils of the dilemmas of HIV AIDS. No, I cannot answer all of the questions, but I can remind us that in the aggravating, irritating, thorny places of our lives, God has still made God's self available and accessible to us. No, I do not can't come to this moment to tell you that everything's going to be all right. It's going to get be over in the morning no I cannot tell you that but I can assure you that Jesus himself said that God's grace is sufficient that God's grace is sufficient and that simply means that God is available and accessible to us that God never leaves us God never forsakes us no wonder they call grace amazing yes no wonder they say it's still amazing you you should know the hymn by now <laughs> amazing grace how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind, but now I see. I thank God, Dr. Dunn, for all of the stanzas that were written to that song. But my ancestors decided once they sang all the other stanzas to write another one themselves. And when they wrote that last stanza, it had nothing to do with all of the other stanzas that were written. They just thought about the amazing grace of God. And the last, the sixth stanza that my ancestors wrote went a little something like this praise God praise God praise God praise God the same two words through the entirety of the stanza because they understood that grace is so amazing that the only response to the grace of God should be the praise of God and today my friends despite the thorny seasons that some of us have to endure despite the reality that the thorn will not be taken away we are grateful today that God's grace is still available accessible and amazing I close my message. I've held you too long. <laughs> but I close the message when I remind you of one other hymn. 
that blesses my soul. It's, it's an old hymn. We don't sing it much anymore. Some, some, some church traditions may have never heard of it, but come thou fount of every blessing penned by Robert Robinson still blesses my soul. The last stanza thereof, he says, oh, to grace, how great a debtor. Daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy grace, Lord, like a fetter, bind my wandering soul to thee. Oh, my beloved sisters and brothers, as you go through this day, as you communicate one with another about the best ways to help sisters and brothers who struggle, help sisters and brothers who live with HIV AIDS. I like that. They're living with it. Thorn is not taken away, but they are living with it by the grace of God. Be a debtor to God's grace today. Be a debtor to that availability, that accessibility, that amazing reality that comes from God and God alone. No, Paul, that's not what you prayed for. But I contend that's exactly what you needed because it developed a dependence upon the divine. It produced a persistence in your prayers and it cultivated your Christian character. He speaks differently in verses 12 and in verse 11 and 10. He speaks differently in those verses than he spoke in the other verses. He says, I've decided to boast now in the God who strengthens me. I boast now even in my infirmity because when I'm weak, then I'm strong. God's power is displayed. I'm still able to live. I'm still able to survive and thrive because the grace of God, the presence of God has been made available and accessible. And every day I lie down in repose, I remember it's amazing. So great God, we thank you for your great grace. We thank you for loving us enough to give to us the opportunity to experience your presence in <coughs> phenomenal and powerful ways. <clears throat> your people gather together even in a virtual reality today to think through how we might educate and encourage and edify brothers and sisters with regard to HIV AIDS. I thank you for the testimonies of the <coughs> Tiffany's all around the world that you have developed them in ways that they never would have been developed. And I thank you that Tiffany is yet a testimony to your great grace. Not just the Tiffany in Houston, Texas, but all of my Tiffany sisters and all of my brothers, Theodores, who, who understand the amazing grace of God. Thank you, God, for your amazing grace. And we may we be forever a debtor to the great grace we have received. We give you praise on this Wednesday, this, this Saturday morning for the opportunity that you've given to us to be recipients of a great grace that comes from you and you alone. May our lives be testaments to your grace henceforth now and forevermore. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. God bless you and may your day be profitable and fruitful for the glory of God. Amen, amen. God bless the Reverend Dr. Marcus Cosby down there in my hometown of Houston, Texas, reminding us that sometimes what we pray for isn't necessarily what we need, uh, but also reminding us that God's grace is sufficient to color, cover all of our needs. Uh, we give thanks for his witness and for that mighty word. Uh, and I give thanks uh, for this opportunity to not only be in the midst of uh, you faithful followers, but also to be in the midst of great scholars, uh, great thinkers, uh, great people of God who have joined us today uh, in order to make this event a success. Uh, I am the Dr. Ulysses uh, Burley, founder of UB The Cure LLC. Uh, I am also a member of the planning committee, committee for this World AIDS Day uh, Clergy and Lay Leadership Summit. Uh, and it is my uh, divine pleasure uh, to introduce to you our next speaker, our next presenter, the Dr. 
Stefan E. Wallace, uh, who is a research epidemiologist and an internationally recognized public health and social justice leader with more than 20 years of sexual and public health experience and more than 25 years of social justice and community mobilization experience. Dr. Wallace serves as the Director of External Relations for the COVID-19 Prevention Trials Network and the HIV Vaccine Trials Network. And he's also a staff scientist in the Vaccine and Infectious Disease Division at Fred Hutch and the Clinical Assistant Professor in the Department of Global Health at the University of Washington. There's so much more I could say about this brother, but I'll leave it there and invite him now to deliver his very timely presentation. Uh, I welcome to you uh, and introduce to others uh, the Dr. Stefan E. Wallace. Hello, hello. Good morning. Thank you for that introduction, <clears throat> uh, Dr. Burley. I am happy to be here. Appreciate the invitation. Um, I was able to catch some of the sermon that just happened, so that was great for my spirit as well. Um, I'm happy to start my presentation having uh, challenges with screen sharing and saying it's disabled. All right, you should be able to see my slides now. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to move through this a bit quickly, but uh, certainly let me know if there are any critical questions that anyone has. Um, Dr. Burley did a great introduction, so I won't spend any more time there, but to say that I am thankful to be able to speak and talk to you all today about this very important topic. Regarding COVID-19 inequities, um, what we understand is, is that there are many factors that increase a person's and community's susceptibility or risk for COVID-19 disease. We understand that people of color are largely overrepresented in what we refer to as the essential workforce. These are industries that increase exposure of people because they put them either in direct contact with individuals on a consistent basis or because they are um, in, in buildings or in other uh, settings that also increase their risk. Um, and that these jobs tend to uh, not provide benefits uh, or, or substantial benefits, including health insurance, <clears throat> uh, child care, and working from home options, among others. We understand that due to uh, systemic <clears throat> and structural racism, that many communities, particularly communities of color, live in densely populated neighborhoods and housing settings, um, and that many communities are forced to live in many times multi-generational households with limited space, uh, also as a result of uh, systemic racism, redlining, and gentrification, and that many communities have limited access to healthier food options, which impacts our overall health and places us at greater risk for negative health outcomes. That the, per, that the continued experiences and <clears throat> uh, exposure to chronic stress also impacts our immune system and our susceptibility uh, to various health conditions. And this chronic stress is facilitated by uh, uh, historical uh, and structural racism uh, increased exposure to violence and everyday aggressions and trauma. Regarding the cases, I just wanted to highlight uh, for COVID-19 cases that you will see in many communities that the, the number of cases e exceeds the population size. And when we see that, we refer to that as, uh, as being disproportionate. So uh, for Black, and Hispanic Latinx communities um, and for our American Indian Native Alaskan communities as well as our Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander communities, uh, we see that there is a disproportionate impact. Um, recognizing that the data for 
uh, Asian communities, Native Hawaiian and American Indian communities is limited. Uh, so we understand that these case counts are likely significantly higher than what's actually indicated here, as well as for uh, the Black community. So it's, it's clear that uh, communities of color are being disproportionately impacted by COVID-19 disease. With respect to hospitalizations, we see similar trends that communities of color are bearing the, the burden of disease and the impact of COVID-19 disease. <clears throat> and with uh, COVID-19 related deaths, we also see that communities of color um, are disproportionately bearing the burden in this way as well. So to talk a little bit more about vaccines, um, I'm sure you all have probably heard some things in the media uh, recently about vaccines. So what are vaccines? Bar vaccines are uh, basically products that teach your body to recognize and fight foreign invaders. And when we think about a vaccine, there are a few things that we uh, know and envision that it would do. <clears throat> excuse me, uh, for the person who gets the vaccine, so at the individual level, we can recognize that a vaccine could prevent infection, it could prevent disease, and it also could potentially delay disease progression. And these, this order is really important because the, the priority, of course, for a vaccine, we would want it to ultimately prevent a person from uh, getting infected, but sometimes that isn't possible. So the next sort of uh, approach or, or level would be to see if we can prevent a person from developing uh, illness if they do get infected. And then of course, uh, if we aren't able to prevent uh, disease uh, illness, then we would want to be able to delay disease progression. So for the community though, um, we're looking at this concept called herd immunity. And really part of this is, is just the idea that you are vaccinating a sufficient number of people in a community to prevent further transmission of a particular disease. We recognize that vaccines have been used around the world as well as here in the US um, and most commonly, we would think of immunizations, uh, measles, mumps, rubella, <clears throat> uh, even the flu shot, uh, and that these are also uh, vaccines. And that vaccines are safe when they're manufactured and used properly, uh, and that they're significantly more cost effective compared to the treatment of any particular disease. And we've been able to eliminate smallpox worldwide and uh, come really close to eliminating polio worldwide through the use of vaccines. And of course, we've been able to help reduce the incidence of HPV in young people through the use of uh, HPV vaccines as well. So the impact of vaccines in the US in particular um, <clears throat> is, is really important to note in that you can see from this slide that the number of cases at baseline 20th century before a vaccine came onto market for these diseases. And then in 2008, um, there was a significant drop in the number of cases of these diseases. Um, and this was through the use of vaccines and, and appropriate public health messaging. So, I mentioned before what we think and what we know a vaccine can do uh, in general, but speaking now about SARS-CoV-2, which is the virus that causes COVID-19, that we also recognize that there are benefits to the community as well as the individual for a COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2 vaccine. The reduction of severity of illness and potentially preventing infection for the individual and reducing transmission and supporting healthier communities uh, is an impact and um, outcome for SARS-CoV-2 vaccine. And how does vaccines work specifically? Well, they work essentially by, by teaching your body to recognize the virus or disease. 
and then allowing or supporting your immune system's response to begin sending in fighter cells and antibodies that go into action with the goal of blocking or controlling the virus or and eliminating it. So one of the big questions that we often get, can vaccines cause the infection or the illness? And in this respect, we can say no, the vaccines being tested are made from laboratory made pieces copied from the outside of the virus, not the whole virus, not the live virus. So no one can contract or can acquire uh, the virus or the illness from the vaccine because there's no actual part of the virus inside of the vaccine. We typically talk about this analogy of a bike in that if you take a tire, a handlebar, and a, and a chain, a bike chain, and you add them together, could you create a bike if you just add those three pieces? And of course you cannot. And so it's, it's important to sort of think about that in the context of uh, this scenario. So to talk a little bit more about the COVID-19 prevention network, um, the HIV vaccine trials network, which is one of the organizations that's a part of, or that, that's comprised in the, H, in the COVPN, is an international global research organization with clinical trial sites, communities, uh, laboratories, uh, and statisticians around the, around the world working on developing global vaccines. And from 2000 to present, the HVTN has conducted 80 or more clinical trials. We have currently more than 100 clinical research sites around the world and have enrolled more than 22,000 persons. Uh, and this is just specifically for the HIV portfolio of our work. So more about the COVID-19 prevention network. Again, I mentioned the HIV vaccine trials network is one of the organizations a part of it, but there are three others, including the infectious disease clinical research consortium, the HIV prevention trials network, and the AIDS clinical trials group. And these four institutions represent more than two decades um, of clinical research experience, HIV prevention experience, HIV research experience, community engagement experience, laboratory science, and clinical expertise. And all of these institutions have leveraged uh, their expertise and pivoted that to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic. There are several studies that are ongoing. Uh, a couple of them are uh, yet to have started. Uh, the Moderna study, which you may have heard about in the news, um, um, which is looking at enrolling 30,000 persons, that study has completed enrollment and follow-up will continue uh, to continue looking at safety and continue looking at um, uh, uh, efficacy as the study continues. AstraZeneca, 30,000 persons as well. The study is ongoing and currently enrolling. The Janssen phase three study, looking at about 60,000 persons. That study is also currently ongoing and enrolling. The Novavax study, which is about to start soon, uh, will be looking at about 30,000 people to enroll. And the Sanofi study uh, will be starting around uh, early 2021. So I, I want to call attention to the bars on the right hand side that these sort of orange reddish bars represent just the, the window of period for enrollment in the study. And then the gold bar represents the follow up period where we continue to touch base with study participants and engage them, uh, check on their health um, and ensure that they're that they're OK as they're moving through uh, the closing of the study. And we're continuing to collect data throughout this entire process as well. So what are we hoping to learn from all of these studies in general? There are key questions that we have that we're seeking answers to. Do the vaccines create an immune response that protects people from 
COVID-19 disease. So as I mentioned before in a prior slide, does it prevent disease? Um, or can the immune response protect against infection? So the primary question that these studies are looking to answer is the prevention of disease and secondarily, will it prevent infection? Also to determine whether or not um, these vaccines continue to be safe as indicated in earlier phase studies and um, are the vaccines well tolerated? Can they be administered and given um, without making people too uncomfortable? So lots of next steps, uh, lots of things unknown. Um, the, as I mentioned before, the vaccine studies that we're looking at for SARS-CoV-2 um, are primarily looking at the prevention of disease and not infection. So what, is what needs to be understood uh, through the collection of additional data is whether the prevention of infection is possible. Uh, and we will find that out as we continue to collect additional data. The recent results that you might have heard uh, in the media regarding the Moderna study in particular uh, and the Pfizer study, those results represent uh, efficacy in terms of prevention of disease and not prevention of infection as well. So I just want to clarify that in case there were questions. We also are curious about whether or not uh, persons who are vaccinated, uh, if we understand that they can, uh, or it's possible that they can still acquire the infection, can they onwardly transmit it to other people? Uh, and then there are, of course, the questions regarding dosing and rolling out. Uh, in particular, um, both the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines require a colder storage uh, than normal for vaccines. Um, so there are some considerations there regarding logistics. COVID-19 prevention uh, measures should absolutely continue um, even after vaccine rollout begins in specific areas uh, and eventually all areas. Um, it's important because we still have questions that we need to answer. Um, so it's not yet time to stop wearing masks or stop physical distancing and stop practicing other measures to limit your exposure. The vaccine dissemination process, um, as you may have heard, uh, will soon begin. Um, many uh, states have completed vaccine dissemination plans um, as directed by the CDC. Many of these plans are public um, information are available on the State Health Department's website. Um, I think it's really important to consider uh, for this how faith communities um, can be involved in helping to communicate uh, messages regarding um, the vaccine dissemination process, including um, the prioritization of the vaccines, I think would be a really important conversation to engage. And to also know that, that a lot of this is being determined by frameworks uh, for equitable allocation of the vaccine that were put together by the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine, um, a national cohort of folks who of scientists who came together to, uh, to consider um, what are the, the best possible strategies to ensure an effective rollout of vaccines. And just wanna say thank you to some folks that I work with uh, directly um, and who also are in leadership of the networks as well as the NIH. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, that was absolutely amazing. And we, we appreciate th that guidance. There were some questions that, that we had in the chat briefly. And one of the questions I, I did, Dr. Wallace, just want to address briefly before we move forward um, with our panel is, it says, if, a, if you are a person that doesn't engage in vaccines, what reaction can they expect from the COVID-19 vaccine? Um, well, vaccines are general uh, and they're, side effects, and we refer to them, I, I assume the question is about side effects. Um, so if we're talking about side effects, so there's some sort of consistent side effects that we typically see across all vaccines. If you stick a needle in your arm, you know, no matter it's a vaccine or, you know, you're drawing blood, you're likely to have a sore arm around the area where you got the shot, you know, or where you drew blood. Um, Typically, we see in vaccines um, um, some degree of uh, a headache or nausea, 
uh, low grade fever. Um, not everyone experiences these kinds of side effects. So they are individual um, in terms of how people experience them, but these are the common side effects that we see in vaccines. Well, thank you so much for that. Um, I really appreciate that. And, and I'll, I'll monitor the chat to see if we can also uh, answer any of the questions um, in, during our panel session. So uh, thank you so much for that, that excellent presentation, Dr. Wallace. So now I, I have the pleasure of, of moving us forward um, into what is gonna be, I hope and pray, an amazing panel, panel discussion. Um, first of all, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. Kareem Watson. I'm gonna be moderating this panel today of some amazing experts that we have. And um, I am a community health scientist by training. Um, my work particularly focuses on cancer prevention and control. I, I have the privilege of now serving as the Associate Executive Director of the Miles Square Health Center, which is a group of fairly qualified health centers um, throughout the city of Chicago um, and now in Rockford, Illinois as well. And so um, I've been part of the Faith and Clergy Lay Leadership Planning Committee in the past, and it is literally an honor, privilege, and blessing to, to be here. And so as we move into this panel discussion, I want to first um, introduce our group of amazing experts and panelists. And I'm going to pose a question to them after I read their introduction of we've heard from our, um, I want to also frame this for you a little bit as we think about the intersectionality. That's going to be a word I want us to think about, this intersectionality. And I know, Dr. Searcy, that concept the intersectionality sits at the, a lot of the basis of your work. But when I was doing some homework for this, uh, Dr. Burley and Ms. Smith, I, when some of the data that we saw is that when I looked at some of the same zip codes in Chicago that are impacted by COVID-19, those same communities are the same ones that have higher incidence and prevalence for HIV and AIDS, whether it be mor morbidity, people getting sick, or mortality, people dying from that. And, and I also, if you do another heat map, as a, as a community health scientist, I love these little maps. If you look at the sprinkling of churches and faith communities throughout where we have COVID-19 and where we have incidents and prevalence of, of HIV and AIDS, it's a whole lot of little dots that pop up for where faith communities are located. So after I read your introduction, I, I wanna ask you this question of what do you bring to this space, this space today? And so as a community health scientist, as a executive director of a so associate executive director of FQHC, I, I hope I bring to this space this this commitment to authentic work, of of doing the work and creating access and awareness. That's one thing I've been prayerful about when I'm bringing to the space today. And so our panelists today includes Miss Vanessa Smith who's the executive director of the Southside Health Center. And for more than 30 years, the Southside Health Center has provided critical services to help negate both violence prevention and the incidence and impact of HIV AIDS in the African-American community. Initially founded in 1987, their 501c3 is a nonprofit focused on educating the African-American religious community so it could become more sensitive to the needs of people impacted by HIV and AIDS. And since that time, the Southside Health Center services has evolved on to include HIV AIDS outreach and direct care services and a comprehensive range of youth centered and capacity building programs to engage other nonprofit organizations to better serve our communities. We also have Dr. Jasmine Searcy, a licensed clinical psychologist with the Near North Health Centers, one of our premier fairly qualified health centers um, in the Chicagoland area. And her work at Near North addresses the intersection um, in her therapy work. She offers an eclectic set of evidence-based treatment interventions, including cognitive behavioral therapy, motivational interviewing, clinical hypnosis, and parent management training to patients and their families presenting with general outpatient mental health concerns, such as things as depression, anxieties, and difficulties with substance abuse, and complications secondary to chronic or acute medical conditions, such as HIV and diabetes. And last but not least, we have Dr. Ulysses Burley the third, the founder of You Be The Cure, LLC, a proprietary consulting firm um, on the intersection of faith, health, and human rights. Ulysses served as a member serves as a member of the executive committee of the World Council of Churches, as well as the United States Presidential Advisory Council on HIV AIDS under the Obama administration. He has been recognized by the National Minority Quality Forum as a top 40 under 40 member. And I always say, I'm, I'm just, I'm waiting for the text or the email about the appointment of, of Dr. Burley to one of these presidential cabinets. I'm just waiting for that announcement to come out soon. So, and I can say, I knew him when 
And but without further ado, um, I could read their bios, uh, but with, I want to open it up by you all can provide a little bit of welcome to our, our attendees and our audience today about what you all bring to this space. I'll start with you, uh, Ms. Smith. Vanessa still with us? Uh, yes, I am. Can you hear me okay now? We can hear you. Yes, we can. All right. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Watson, for that great introduction of uh, Southside Health Center and our organization. Uh, uh, you know, Southside Health Center was uh, started by my mother, uh, Betty Smith, uh, started uh, back in 1987 when she saw in the uh, a South Suburban Hospital, people dying of HIV and AIDS. And of course, they did not look like the people or reflect the people that they had portrayed in the media as white gay men. These were, you know, black men, gay men, also, uh, you know, men uh, with addiction, women with addiction. And so uh, one young man came into the, uh, into the hospital, uh, of course, he was severely ill. He was in hospice care, and he called for his pastor and preacher and to give him last life. And um, the, the pastor refused to go into the room. And at that point, my mother knew that she couldn't get HIV and AIDS through, um, you know, casual contact. And so what she saw disturbed her. And so she wanted to, you know, being a woman of faith, being a woman of God, that she wanted to educate people around uh, HIV and AIDS, in particular, the uh, religious community. And that's kind of how uh, Southside Health Center got started. And so hopefully, you know, part of the conversation I can bring is through an advocacy social justice center uh, today and really encourage um, the listening audience to really engage in um, social justice issues. You know, Martin Luther King is right around the corner. And, you know, one of our slogans is that uh, HIV and AIDS is a social justice imperative. You know, everyone needs information around this issue um, and to help us combat, combat stigma, discrimination. And so hopefully I can bring that type of lens up. Thank you so much for that. Dr. Searcy, you're still muted. Yes, thank you so uh, much, Dr. Watson, and um, good afternoon, everyone. I would say I love my work. Um, I definitely can bring to this space the ability to connect with those who are here. I've actually have uh, loved ones, including family and friends who've been impacted by HIV, which further has driven my uh, desire to work with uh, our EIS team at Near North. Um, so that's one part of it. The second part of it that I would like to bring to the space is just um, my insight and awareness regarding how the mind and body is connected, uh, specifically from a behavioral health standpoint and approach um, for listeners. And I think I could bring that to this space and this conversation on the panel. So thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Dr. Burley. Thank you, Dr. Watson. For me, I think my role on this panel is to heal the divide between faith and science. Mm -hmm. And so as both a scientist and a person of deep faith, uh, who has chosen to uh, do this work in the context of everything that's been mentioned by my co-panelists, social justice, human rights, uh, and health e equity. Uh, but even more than that, in the context of belief systems, um, I wholly believe that um, faith and science are more alike than they are different uh, in terms of their core principles of life and life abundantly. Uh, and I believe faith is grounded in the preservation and abundance of a life well lived. Uh, likewise, I believe scientific research uh, is all about the extension of life, the preservation of life uh, and of a quality life. Um, and so I hope that uh, having my foot firmly planted in both of those arenas uh, that we can begin to bridge the gap uh, between 
uh, faith and science that sometimes exists. Thank you for that. that that's really, that's some really important grounding of, of, of this conversation of, of bridging that gap. And, and one of the things before we go into question one, I want to uh, use this space as well to kind of address some myths or and also provide some some elevated some, some information. For example, one of the questions I got early on from some, some people in the community was, you know, are people that are living with HIV and AIDS at greater risk of, of COVID-19? And was there things that that population, you know, of, of patients and community members that they should be doing differently than others? And what we know, and you know, and doing our later on in the q and I would love for Dr. Wallace to even comment on this later on. But what we know, and, and Dr. Bailey, you could speak to this as well, is that, you know, for those patients that are living with a, you know, compromised immune system, but if they have a control, if they've been on their regimens of their medication consistently, they've been able to suppress their viral load, get their CD4 counts up. And those are all numbers. We don't want to be too scientific of people because we can speak this jargon, this lingo. But what we mean is that those, those are the numbers that you that that indicate that you are healthy, that you are doing everything you need to do, and that we of the system has done what we need to do for you too, right? To right. ensure that you are able to combat that what, what's now become thankfully a chronic illness of, of HIV and, and AIDS. And, and some things that we want to remind as I talk about bringing access and awareness to the space, we things that I've encouraged our community members to do is like, it's not so much that you're at elevated risk if you have you know, successfully been on a, a regimen of medications, but you may want to do things like make sure this, and the CDC, CDC recommends this as well, at least have a 30-day supply of your meds on hand. Ideally, we are encouraging our patients to now have a 90-day supply a medication on hand because we with all the civil unrest that's often justified what people are dealing with in our in our country and, and everything so those are some things too that we'll be dropping some nuggets throughout this this conversation um and before i move on to the first question dr burley or, or dr search did you want to comment about that a little bit kind of some of dispelling that that myth about vulnerable populations and what they should be doing sure i can Okay, Dr. no, please, I was going please. to say, yeah. I definitely agree with you when patients come in, even though I'm the psychological aspect of the team, I do remind them that let's not get focused on the numbers, but to make sure that we are doing everything from a holistic standpoint to uh, be resilient in the midst of COVID. And I often just remind patients that just because you have HIV does not make you susceptible, right? Meaning A equals B, you're not gonna get COVID because of that. But if we are, are taking care of ourselves from a holistic per perspective, then I would say, hey, we've reduced our chances from being vulnerable to COVID-19. So that's all I wanted to add, so. Thank you for that. Yeah, I, I uh, affirm uh, that as well. Uh, and you're absolutely correct, uh, Dr. Watson. And from a medical standpoint, um, people living with HIV whose disease is well controlled, uh, who have access to consistent uh, antiretroviral medication, uh, as well as care, uh, are no more susceptible to COVID-19 infection than um, people who are not living with HIV. Uh, and I think that speaks to the tremendous progress that we have made uh, with HIV and AIDS uh, in terms of uh, making it a chronic disease, as you mentioned. Uh, but even more than that, uh, making sure that people are able to live normal, healthy lives, um, you know, with HIV. Uh, and so wanted to highlight that now. That's not to say that people living with HIV are not more susceptible to COVID-19 infection because of social and systemic factors. Right. Um, it's not necessarily science and medicine, but we do know that people living with HIV and AIDS are disproportionately uh, impacted by the social determinants of health. Uh, and so when you talk about housing security, or food security, uh, or uh, discrimination, whether it's homophobia or transphobia uh, or racism, um, these are all factors that we know uh, are disproportionately impacting uh, people and therefore making them more vulnerable to COVID-19. And so uh, in many aspects, um, the science, the biomedicine has done its job. We uh, have more work to do uh, in terms of uh, social uh, and uh, um, you know, our public health infrastructure 
uh, in terms of, uh, to Dr. Searcy's point, providing and taking care of the whole person, right? And so not just their physical, but their social, their mental, their spiritual. Uh, and so that's why I'm really grateful for conversations like this that uh, intricately weaves all of those principles together. Thank you for that. And, and Ms. Smith, I want to pose this, this next question to you, and, and I want all the panelists to chime in, but our theme this year is breaking the silence of HIV AIDS amid, amidst COVID-19. And we've heard a lot about the racial inequities in Black and Brown and marginalized communities, um, the, how they've been impacted by COVID-19. How have communities that have been impacted by HIV AIDS been further impacted by COVID-19? Kind of for continuing on this theme that Dr. Burley was talking about. What have you seen in the work that you all are doing on the Southside Health Center um, that you, that has addressed this? Well, certainly, can you hear me better now? I know yep. that mm -hmm. there was a little bit of a, a issue with my sound. So, you know, what we've seen is, you know, we provide mobile HIV testing services throughout the, 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 the city of Chicago and the community. And we continue and we chose to continue to do that even uh, amongst you know, this, this pandemic. And what we've seen is that people have been challenged with uh, you know, getting access to, to, uh, to, to food, to COVID testing, uh, to a lot of other additional services that they normally would have received, right? And we're also seeing, I think, an attack on, um, on HIV services, right? Because a lot of times, you know, because we are living in this 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 uh, pandemic, uh, we're we're seeing that you know people are threatening to redirect funds that should be going to people uh, black and brown communities to address other issues, and so we have to be vigilant that those things do not happen in our community. Um, we see a lot of isolation, you know, um, uh, once the restriction, the stay at home restrictions were lifted, we had an outpouring of clients wanting to come back and socialize. And, uh, and so we feared, you know, that uh, I think it was Dr. Wallace who said the chronic trauma that people are facing uh, is a real issue. And it's going to take us some time, quite some time for our clients to even uh, uh, get through the, the trauma of COVID, you know, even though they may not necessarily have been, um, you know, uh, exposed to COVID, but the trauma of, you know, always trying to, you know, be safe uh, can be very detrimental to a person's mental health st status. So that's kind of like what we're seeing right now. Thank you. And and speaking of building on that, we're going to just take a slight pivot, Dr. Searcy, when you see talked about this trauma. And so mm -hmm. I, one of the one of the questions in the chat was what have been the challenges for our younger population with HIV AIDS and COVID-19 that, that we should be aware of and thinking about these challenges in terms of the trauma that you saw in your youth and young, your young adult and adolescents even prior to this happening, right, to COVID-19, and this is just tr continuation of this trauma. What are some of the things we should be aware of? Yeah, um, so the carious trauma, <laughs> you know, and that's just um, hearing people's story, you know, for those who are listening, hearing people's story, watching the news, then you also have your own personal stuff, whether you're in the healthcare field or you're just working, but vicarious trauma, but in the younger population, what I've seen uh, specifically, and when I say younger, I'm saying anything, you know, any youth between or under 26 years, between 15 and 26 years of age that I see at Near North specific, specifically for HIV, I've seen more of risk-taking behaviors in the midst of this, right? So you have um, COVID, but in the younger population, I've seen more anxiety, more depressive related symptoms, more risk taking behaviors as it relates to substance abuse, right? Um, because of COVID. Um, and if we think about trauma, I'm thinking about it, we think about the complex trauma. So a lot of youth have already come with trauma to me in my assessment, and I'm trying to treat that trauma. Then we add COVID to the top of that, and you add a, that trauma on top of that. So it's just spiraled out of control. But when I think about 
um, the HIV population as a whole, right? So adults, primarily that I've seen both females, males, or however um, individuals identify, I've seen an increase in depression, an increase in anxiety, um, a lot of social isolation, an increase in substance use, whether that's marijuana, whether that's alcohol use. Um, I do give it to our team. We found unique ways to address that, whether that's virtual, meeting virtually, and doing mental health services, or we're actually using, um, or our providers are actually meeting with patients virtually. Um, there's an increase where patients don't wanna come into the health centers. And for me, um, I've gotten, I think my numbers from a mental health standpoint have doubled, right, from just our EIS team. <laughs> Dr. Searcy, now if someone is worried about, um, I know one of the challenges that we faced at Miles Square was parents still worried about, you know, coming into the clinics for those visits. Are you all offering any telehealth or any visits via phone or that, that you could provide? And if so, how can they reach you? Because it may be someone listening via Facebook or on this panel, they've been saying, I need to get access to, and, okay. and I, I get a text maybe, I, and I'm not exaggerating, once right. a week from someone saying, can you recommend a psychologist or a psychiatrist that is African-American? Yeah. So how can they reach you, Dr. Searcy? Because we need you. Absolutely. So at Near North, um, what they would do is they would have to see either a pediatrician or a primary. So they just go make a visit. During that visit, they'll say, you know what, how can I get connected to mental health? And Obviously, the pediatrician, whether that's the internal medicine provider, say, oh, you know what, Dr. Searcy is here. I do integrated behavioral health, and they could uh, make an appointment with me um, that way. Mm -hmm. So I'll ask you to put that number in the chat later on, because yes. we, we, want our, we want us to be a, a think and do tank. Absolutely. And so we want, we want our people to be able to have access. Absolutely. And so, and so I want to, again, um, Dr. Burley, I want to pose this question to you. Um, we, we talked about trauma. And in my work um, as a, a public health researcher, one of the things I do is ensure diversity in clinical trials. And so I want to address a question in the chat, but I also want to frame it. The question talked about historical trauma that has led to medical mistrust. And, and be, unfortunately, because of the politicizing, of science that is happening right now, we're further perpetuating that trauma. For example, we use terms, and, and this is not a, a judgment, but we, we, we say things like the Tuskegee experiment. I caution our community members to not call it the Tuskegee experiment because Tuskegee did nothing to ask for that study. What it was, was the United States public health syphilis study in Tuskegee, Alabama. Just that simple framing of that context matters because if we're not careful, we'll, we'll put this bias towards Tuskegee and just in the framing of that study. And what we should be putting the bias towards is the United States Public Health Service study. Not that I wanna further perpetuate that mistrust, but that's important. And as a result of that study, what I like to tell community members is that we now have things in place that can provide what I call the police of research, right? We have institutional review boards, we have consent forms, all these things did not exist when that mis, you know, malaligned study happened. And, and I have the fortune of working with Miss Veronica Robinson, who is the great granddaughter of Henrietta Lacks. And I have Veronica here in Chicago about a couple years ago to talk about what does she think the legacy of her great grandmother, Henrietta Lacks, would be in encouraging communities to participate in, in research. So, so Dr. Burley, in your work, as an advocate and you be the cure, what have been some of the things you've done to address this justified medical mistrust that we see in the African-American community and how that medical mistrust is even impacting how we respond to both testing and ultimately how we may respond to the vaccine? Absolutely. The first thing is I try and reframe the conversation from medical mistrust to medical untrustworthiness. Okay. Uh, because trustworthiness is a prerequisite to trust. And I believe when we frame it as medical mistrust, we put the onus, the burden of proof on uh, the consumer, on the population, and in this case, people of color. Uh, when in fact, we have well-documented instances of uh, legacies of medical untrustworthiness in history, right? We talked about Henrietta Lacks. Um, 
we talked about the uh, uh, you know Tuskegee study of untreated syphilis in Negro men. Uh, but even, you know, further back from that, you know, Anarcha Westcott uh, and, uh, you know, other Black women who were, you know, tested on by J. Marion Sims, who we now call, you know, the father of gynecology. Well, you know, he was able to acquire so much knowledge because, you know, he tested on Black women uh, without their consent uh, and oftentimes without anesthesia, right? Um, and so, you know, I prefer to call Anarcha Westcott the, the, the mother of gynecology, if you will. Uh, you know, Fannie Lou Hamer, who we, you know, often know as being a civil rights champion, uh, but she was also a victim of medical untrustworthiness, right? Uh, you know, Mississippi appendectomy. She went into the hospital to have her appendix removed and she left without a uterus, right? They were sterilizing Black women. Uh, in the South then, and, you know, we even still see, you know, mentions of sterilization among, you know, our immigrant populations even today, right? And so um, there's just cause for the way in which people feel, as you mentioned, it's definitely valid, uh, but also, as you mentioned, and what's important is that as a result of these injustices, uh, particular measures have been put in place to make sure that they don't happen again. So. Uh, informed consent was not uh, a part of the Tuskegee process, uh, right? Uh, and so now everyone uh, has to consent to any medical research uh, that they participate in, uh, and they have the ability to opt out of their research at any given point. Uh, and we have institu it's, 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 it's institutional review boards. Um, as you mentioned, we have data safety monitoring boards uh, that are apart from um, the trials and the studies, independent entities uh, of experts and scientists, uh, and a host of other, uh, you know, fail-safe measures put in place to ensure that uh, everything that's done is ethical uh, and just. However, you don't have to go back to the 1970s uh, of Tuskegee or even further back to Henrietta Lacks and the, and the others. We experience, as people of color, medical bias in our daily lives, right? Um, you know, if we have Black grandmothers, uh, we have, you know, Black mothers who have experienced, um, you know, disproportionality as it relates to their maternal health, yeah. uh, right? Uh, and we know that that exists across socioeconomic status, right? We saw the story of Serena Williams having to advocate for her own maternal health, the most uh, <laughs> popular, um, you know, female athlete in the world, uh, and she's having to advocate for her own health, uh, despite her popularity or her fame uh, or her wealth. And so, um, as you mentioned, it's definitely valid. Um, I think the promises in these faces that you see on this screen, uh, who are a part of the work, uh, who are trustworthy, uh, have proven themselves trustworthy in community, uh, knowing that uh, you know, we are a part of these processes uh, and that we are engaged in education and information sharing that is culturally competent uh, to our communities uh, in such a way that uh, we hope uh, kind of uh, uh, massages some of that fear and anxiety and mistrust, uh, as we put it. And so uh, the system isn't perfect um, and the system definitely still uh, has biases against people of color, uh, but as it relates to biomedicine, as it relates to clinical research, as it relates to um, the development of vaccines in this case, um, you know, those safeguards are in place yeah. uh, to make sure that um, they're just, that they up uphold human rights standards uh, and health equity. Um, and those of us, uh, who are on that side of the work uh, will continue to uh, make sure that that's true um, because it's not just for you all, it's for ourselves as well, right? Uh, I want to be able to participate in the biomedical solution for COVID-19, you know, when it becomes widely available. And I want to do so with confidence. And I want to be able to tell my family that they can do so as well. And so it's very personal. Um, it's not just professional for us. And I think that there is a certain level of comfort in knowing that. Um, and so I hope that that's uh, articulated and communicated 
uh, even during this forum uh, as we talk about these difficult issues. You, you brought up a very important point. And um, I did a study re a, a few years back of why African-American and Latino, Latinx and Hispanic communities did not participate in clinical trials. Because I want to dis disrupt this myth that we don't want to participate. And one of the things I found out was that you know, this concept of, and I, I love your framing, that re reframing of it, because we have to push each other to reframe, because we've all been colonized to a certain degree in the academy, yeah, right? Yeah, and yeah. so part of that decolonization, we got to dismantle the, the, the framing that we, has been put around a lot of this work. And so when I was doing these focus groups, they were like, Kareem, I would participate. Now I'm always going to give you a side eye and have a little bit of be looking at you with a little side eye because mm -hmm. you, you know the medical community deserves that side eye. But if asked and if appropriate, if, if I engage in a shared decision making conversation, I will likely participate. And that was one thing I walked away with is that there's data to show that it's not that African American, Black, and Brown communities are not participating because of our quote unquote you know lack of trust. We often aren't at the places where those studies are being conducted. So to one of the panelists about how can we ensure more access to clinical trials, one of the things we can do is work with places like the Southside Health Center, FQHCs like Near North, FQHCs like Miles Square, and even faith-based communities to conduct trials in partnership with communities. Um, I was doing a, a prostate cancer screening study of black men, and it was a study we called FUBU, for us, by us. You know, the, the, the urologist I was working with was Dr. Adam Murphy, an African-American male urologist. The, um, we trained a group of citizen scientists, a group of black men to help us spread the message. One of those citizen scientists was my pastor, Dr. Ju um, Reverend Julian DeChazier. And so, you know, taking these trusted messengers and giving them just a little bit more tools, because what we said is that if Pastor Julian uh, you know, can get the message out about social justice through the pulpit, we can give him a little tools also to get the message about health equity out. We train barbers, you know, we, we're passing out fit cards, Dr. Cissy and barbershops for men to get screened for colorectal cancer screening. You know, you return this fit card, you can get $25 off of your next fade. Having those type of conversations in the community. And, and I want to use that to kind of, um, Ms. Smith, I think what you are and your, what your mother's legacy at the Southside Health Center, you all's ability to really pivot and respond to the, the needs of the community in a very community-centric way. We've been having this conversation about the role of the faith community in HIV and AIDS for a while now. We've been having this amazing summit for, for several years, and I think many of us are actively involved in doing the work. I've, uh, Ulysses, I don't think UB The Cure was started when you first, when I first yeah. met you on this panel. So we've seen some progress in this space that I'm very thankful to God for. And, and, and Ms. Smith, I, I think your organization is a perfect example of how we can pivot, you know, the, the faith community. So with that said, what, what is the role of the church? What is the role of the faith community? Because we want to expand the faith community be, beyond the, the church. What, what is the role of the faith community in our response to both COVID-19, as well as our continued response to HIV AIDS? Well, well thank you uh, for that, uh, Dr. Watson. You know, um, you know, my mother was the expert with the faith community. <laughs> However, you know, I, I do want to go back to just one thing uh, around um, the, the mistrust. Um, uh, issue. You know, uh, HIV and AIDS, uh, we've been dealing with this for nearly 40 years, you know, nearly 40 years. Um, and, and the health department has uh, indicated that there are at least 20,000 people living in the city of Chicago that are not on uh, some sort of HIV regimen, right? So uh, people who are undiagnosed, don't know their, their status, don't know that they're, uh, or they have some sort of issue uh, uh, and mistrust of, you know, of, of government. <laughs> um, and so it, you had mentioned that there's sprinklings of churches throughout our community. I remember 20 years ago when we used to have like a liquor store on every corner. And now those liquor stores, thank God, are replaced with churches. Um, but I believe that we can do more. Uh, I believe that the church has a, a, a duty and an obligation to educate 
their parishioners uh, about some of the uh, the health disparities and the social determinants of health that prevent people from um, uh, engaging in the healthcare system. Um, you know, sometimes, uh, unfortunately, some of our churches are still stigmatizing um, uh, the African American gay community. And so I believe that they have a duty and responsibility to be more socially uh, engaged uh, in terms of social justice as well. Uh, yes, we've been able to pivot. We've been able to um, try to bring more services to uh, the community. But unfortunately, we're still seeing people die. We are still even even with the advancements of, of medicine, um, uh, we lost like two people during this whole, uh, uh, two clients during this whole COVID um, this year. Um, uh, and some of them are very young, you know, 23, because, you know, only because they did not have access to, um, to the medicine. And so uh, I think it's just very, very imperative that our church, uh, you know, get involved in HIV social justice uh, issues. Yeah, and I want to encourage our listeners and our our, um, our our audience that if you are a part of a faith community and they have a health ministry, for example, I would encourage you to have conversations with that health ministry about how can your outreach and your engagement change, right? You almost, I, I almost want to encourage our health ministry to think about their role in even this concept of contact tracing, right? Because you're not, you may not be doing a lot of the outreach and engagement activities that you were previously doing as a health ministry. So, you know, should you be training some of your health ministry members about contact tracing, about how they can reach out to members who are attending services virtually now? Can you reach out to them via phone? Can we do phone trees? Thinking about, you know, our youth who may, you, you, we're not seeing them the, the impact of this on our youth and just that concept of social isolation, not being able to be in school right now and having to be homeschooled, we're seeing a tremendous impact. And, and Dr. Searcy, someone in the chat actually wanted to know what has been your experience with school-age children with HIV and AIDS, as well as those school-age children who may be impacted by COVID-19? Because there's this myth that we have to dispel that younger adults are not impacted by uh, by COVID-19, as well as HIV AIDS. So what have you seen in, in your space as a clinical psychologist? Yeah, so especially with the youth, um, definitely the social isolation piece. So kids and youth are going, um, obviously, doing school virtually. So believe it or not, um, thinking about my youth, specifically youth who have uh, HIV, they actually come to me in the clinic, right? So they often say, you know, a doctor says I'm in the house all the time. I just need to get out. And of course we take those precautions and six feet, but they are actually, I'm their outlet, right? So they are again, burned out with school from a virtual format that burnout, you know, I constantly have to be on Zoom for every class. I have to do groups and I'm kind of burned out from that. So that's what I see. I also see, um, you know, heightened depressive relationships uh, related symptoms or anxiety in youth, um, some difficulties with adjustment. I even now see uh, youth who say, I think I have ADHD now because I can't focus, right? You know, so I'm addressing that and how the impact of COVID and being at a screen all day could uh, mimic some of those symptoms of ADHD as well. So those are some, not all of the things that I've been seeing. What I do is I accommodate my patients, obviously being at near North um, because we we are still seeing individuals face to face, so. And, and any, what about messaging for, we're getting ready to, you know, there's some now, narrative out there that we may be returning back to the classroom, you know, mm -hmm. you know and if, if there's a public health guidance, if we can, from the public health community, if we can do what we need to do, we may, there may be a response from, you know, our, our government officials that will allow some of our schools to open their doors back up for those schools, you know, so any messaging you have for parents about returning back for their, their, their children returning back to school? 
Right. I tell parents to do what they feel. Of course, a lot of the kids, they want to go back to school. So the kids that I see, they're ready. They're not thinking about the consequences. They're like, I want to go back to school. Whereas my parents are more like, eh, this isn't the time, right? So what I often tell parents is, uh, number one, make sure the precautions are there in the classroom. Ask what the plan is. What it, What's the outline? What's the plan of action? Or what are the phases? And then two, to ultimately do what they feel they're comfortable with doing. Um, sometimes I have to take off the therapist's hat and give them my opinion, but I have to, I, that's what I tell parents um, at the end of the day. Yeah. And we, and we want to <laughs> remind our, our listeners as well of these, these things that we know to be true. You know, we have to take again, just take out the politics of a mask. I, I, you would, I'm, I'm so upset as a public health practitioner that we've made masks and social distancing, you know, or, or I don't like to say social distance, but physical distance, you know, political, but these things work. We, we know that they do. Let's take the politics out of them. So one of the things we want to do is that also to remind our parents and our listeners to wear the mask and, and as much as possible, do the physical distance in a way that allows you not to become a threat a further threat to those that you love, those that you know, and those that you don't know, because we are our brothers and our sisters keepers. And so in, in this concept of, of the, the, the faith community, this response to the church, you, you, Ulysses, I know you, you served on the executive committee of the World Council of Churches. So I know you have a lens of some best practices of what we can be doing as the a faith community. What would you offer as some of those, that, that, that advice of what the faith community can respond to both COVID-19 as well as the HIV AIDS pandemic? Absolutely. Uh, well, uh, I believe that the faith community is still uh, a harbor of information uh, or can still be a harbor of beneficial information. Um, people have long looked to their faith leaders uh, for guidance. Uh, not just spiritual guidance, but also guidance in their everyday and social lives. We know that uh, our faith often informs other aspects of our lives through this concept of, of intersectionality. Uh, and um, so because of that, I, as you mentioned, I have you know, made a career uh, of UBV Cure and uh, subsequent work to engage faith communities around these issues of science uh, and medicine and public health. Uh, because I understand uh, the importance uh, of uh, positive uh, reinforcement, positive messaging um, that comes from faith communities. Uh, that's been the case as it relates to HIV and AIDS, which uh, has posed its own challenge, as Ms. Smith mentioned, because we have to deal with issues of sex and sexuality and stigma uh, often, you know, end up being... Um, you know, make, make our work difficult uh, in those spaces, right? Um, but we've come along uh, and we're still coming. Uh, but likewise, you know, even when we talk about COVID-19 where sex and sexuality isn't necessarily, uh, you know, a part of the conversation, um, there definitely is still a stigma that exists around medicine, vaccines, you know, the use of artificial or, you know, lab created science to reach healness. Um, and so I think these are very important concepts for faith communities, especially faith leaders, uh, in terms of reimagining or uh, theologizing what healing really means, mm -hmm. right? Um, and that's the case for HIV. Uh, which is an incurable disease. Um, and so then what does healing or, or biblical healing mean for a person living with HIV if the only type of healing that's communicated is a complete cure? Uh, what does that mean for somebody living with uh, a, a disease that doesn't have a cure? And so then we have to re-theologize healing as having access to treatment and prevention, right? Um, so that, you know, we don't, we, we, we have a, a low viral load um, so that we're undetectable, so that uh, we're, we're, we're untransmissible to our loved ones. Uh, and so there needs to be some, some work in contextualizing our contemporary public health issues um, with you know, ancient scripture. Uh, 
there also and needs Dr. Cosby, to be. As Dr. Cosby said, uh, not, not to interject, but it's, no, it kind of goes along with his message this morning. This is not what I pray for. So how, right. how, do, how do we equip our, our, our faith leaders with, the, with right. theological tools to have this conversation? I've, I'm reminded of uh, Reverend Dr. Shirley Fleming, who used to, um, a member of Trinity United Church of Christ, who used to actually train pastors and faith leaders on how to utilize theology to implement and have these conversations. That's right. So, so right now, uh, I am involved in similar training. Uh, as it relates to COVID-19, uh, and it's the continuation of similar training um, from HIV, HIV. We heard from, from Dr. Wallace earlier, uh, who represents the HIV Vaccine Trials Network and now the COVID-19 Prevention Trials Network. Uh, and the HIV Vaccine Trials Network, the HBTN, have begun to make a significant investment in equipping faith leaders uh, around issues of HIV prevention and treatment, but even more than that, biomedical solutions like vaccines that could potentially um, help us to end the epidemic as a public health crisis. Now, as a result of the emergence of COVID-19, uh, the COVID-19 Prevention Network has uh, been developed. Uh, and in that, uh, they have made an investment, uh, again, in faith communities. Uh, and mm -hmm. so myself uh, and about five other colleagues serve as uh, COVID-19 Prevention Network faith ambassadors uh, for the faith initiative and uh, our task our mandate is to engage faith communities faith leaders with factual uh, evidence-based science-based information around COVID-19 um, the vaccines and antibodies that are being developed and evaluated uh, to to potentially prevent uh, COVID-19 disease uh, but also the social determinants of health that intersect with this science um, that our faith leaders encounter every day in, in their lives. Uh, and so we are a diverse uh, group of people of color, specifically because we know that both HIV and COVID-19 have disproportionately impacted people of color uh, who can speak to both uh, these, this intersection of faith and science um, that, I, that I talked about um, and establish networks uh, of faith leaders to conduct COVID-19 educational activities so that people can have the information that they need to make an informed, but also conscious decision about whether or not they participate in biomedicine uh, as it relates to COVID-19 and subsequently HIV uh, moving forward as the HIV epidemic will still be raging even you know once we come out of COVID-19. And so, um, you know, I want to make myself available um, to those persons of faith who are who are who have joined us today um, for that education and that information. Uh, much of it looks like what we're doing right now, Zoom sessions, uh, but it offers for an opportunity for people to get the facts about COVID-19, the disease, um, how it's impacting people of color, um, how our faith relates to it, uh, and then, you know, what are the facts about the vaccines that are being developed, uh, how are they engaging uh, communities like ours, uh, and what is it that we need to know. Uh, my greatest fear is not that um, those of us who need a COVID-19 vaccine, the most won't access it. My greatest fear is that we won't access it because we either don't have enough information, uh, we have the wrong information, or we don't have any information at all. Uh, and so, um, you know, I'm available, uh, and I'm sure my, my co-panelists, my colleagues are available uh, to offer that education, that information, and to develop this community engagement strategy in partnership with our faith communities as we will continue to need this engagement and information uh, at least throughout the next year as it relates to COVID-19 and probably the next 10 years as it relates to HIV and AIDS. So faith and facts. That's it. Faith and facts. And so in, in, for our listeners, our community members, engage us, I, you know, reach out to us. You know, um, like I said, I, I, I have the privilege and blessing of working for a state institution. So I work for you, you know, <laughs> and, right. and work for the FQHC. This is our mission. This is what we were built to do. And, um, and the, I, I yeah, want to make yeah. sure... Can I just before say, you, just before you go, Ms. Smith, I wanted to clear okay. up one point. Um, I wanted to make sure that I don't, um, I didn't want to put misinformation out there. Someone asked about opening our schools back up in January. One of the things I want to remind our listeners of is that we're, we're, you hear a lot of this metaphor of building the plane as we fly it. So oftentimes we have to be careful about misinformation. And so what I, what I meant by that is that we're constantly, and 
I hate to ask the community this, but we, we almost have to ask you to be patient with the public health community because as new information comes out daily, that new information may cause us to have to change and pivot. We may say something on Monday, get new information on Tuesday that changes our response on Wednesday. That, that's unfortunately the nature of this of many emergency responses. So I don't wanna misspeak and say that we know that schools are reopening back up in January, but um, after you go, Ms. Smith, I know Dr. Sissy wanted to talk about this transition. She wanted to speak to a little bit more of um, healthy transitioning back to the classroom. But I'm sorry, Ms. Smith, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to just circle back to, you know, the question that you asked me about, you know, how can um, the faith get more involved, uh, you know, how we pivot uh, so, you know, Southside Health Center, we're now a contact tracing uh, organization. We've hired about 20 individuals from the community, from the LGBT community, uh, individuals that were uh, previously uh, unemployed because of the pandemic. And part of their jobs will be to call individuals that have been exposed to COVID. And one of the things I think is important for the church and the faith community is to encourage parishioners to, you know, uh, answer the call, <laughs> you know, um, uh, talk to people, make sure that, uh, you know, we get a lot of people who just don't answer the calls. Uh, and again, because of uh, the widespread um, community uh, infection of, of COVID, we need to make sure that everyone is, um, uh, you know, responding accordingly, even if they're just, you know, uh, educating, you know, their fellow uh, neighbor about, you know, answering the call uh, and and um, and making sure that, you know, people remain safe. Part of what we're also doing is giving away masks, uh, cloth masks, and certainly encouraging everyone to, to get one. You certainly, um, the for the listening audience out there, um, uh, we have uh, masks available for everyone. And I think that that's just really, really important, whether you agree or whether you don't. I think it's part of, you know, a public health strategy that works, as Dr. Watson and Dr. Wallace have indicated before. And I'm so sorry, my throat is like going in and out. My, <laughs> so, but I appreciate um, being part of this panel today, and hopefully that clarifies uh, my my response. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Smith. And we're we're right at right at about two minutes, you all. This I think we could we could talk all day. And I I just thankful thankful for each of you. But as we close out, I want to make sure we stay on time and have have opportunity for question and answers in a larger space. If in a thirty seconds or less, what do you want to leave our listeners and our attendees with in terms of some action items? We definitely want to make sure that they're wearing their mask and doing their part, but what else do, do we want to have in terms of this call to action? And I'll start with you, uh, um, Ms. Smith. Uh, well, um, uh, part of the theme for today's event was uh, we are all in this together. And I think, um, you know, really making sure that people understand and, uh, you know, what is impacting our community, you know, versus policies out there that will impact um, our communities and making sure that people are just educated and aware um, and that you lend your voice to address the social justice uh, issues in our communities. Uh, again, we, I know you said 30 seconds, uh, there's some legislation in the state of Illinois. Um, it is uh, for Black-led organizations, uh, and it's for the Black community, and it is sorely underfunded. It is only $1.2 million, and we really need that fund to go up to $20 million. Um, and that fund uh, supports, you know, the churches, the community-based organizations, those individuals that address uh, HIV prevention in the community. And so, you know, it's just those types of things that we're all in this together and we would like uh, the church to be in it with us. 
Thank you. And to and so is that to to advocate for that fund? Does that include us voting? Yes. What does that include? What's that action that we have to do? That includes you know calling the the your your local legislator to really you know talk about. It's called the African American Response Act, you know, to call them, say, you know, we need to increase this fund, to, you know, in order for resources to go to, to uh, people living with HIV, as well as the prevention of individuals okay. getting HIV. So thank you. All right. Um, Dr. Searcy, then we'll end with you, Dr. Berg. Okay, I'm going to be brief. So I would say this was a great panel, by the way. I wish it could go on and on um, and I could sit on more panels. Um, I would say make sure that you are... Uh, Beside the regular, uh, regular precautions that we've talked about, making sure that you are aware if you don't know something, ask, okay? If you don't know, um, I'm sorry about that. If you don't know um, information, ask about it rather than just moving forward and not knowing, okay? Make sure you're taking care of your health from a holistic perspective, okay? Whether that's taking precautions, going to get, um, your regular health visits, and also your mental health, okay? Making a coping plan, a safety plan for the current state of our, our country, really, okay? And being able to say no and placing those boundaries as needed. That's what I would leave. That's an action item, yes. Thank you for that. Dr. Burley. Yeah, as it relates to COVID, uh, and more specifically, as it relates to faith communities, uh, my primary action item would be that we don't gather for worship if we can help it. Um, and I know that that is a difficult uh, reality, uh, even as we've, you know, gone nine months now, probably likely not gathering in our, in our buildings. Uh, but from the information that we have and know, um, faith communities, churches, uh, early in the pandemic uh, served as, you know, places for super spreader events to occur just because of the nature of our worship. We sing. Uh, we pray, we we share peace, we hug. Uh, it's a beautiful experience, but it's one that, that gives way to COVID-19 uh, infection. And so until we have a viable um, way out of the uh, pandemic, uh, which right now looks like a vaccine, um, I think that we have to continue to to, to do our part and, and, and not uh, gather. Um, and then even more than that, when a vaccine is available, we have to make sure that uh, we mobilize the same ways in which we do around voting and other issues, um, our people to have access to that if they want to participate in it. Uh, and a part of that is making sure that they have the right information to be able to make an informed decision. Uh, as it relates to HIV and AIDS, um, the current uh, federal HIV plan, uh, its strategy is being updated uh, for uh, 2021 to 2025. Uh, and that public comments period is open until December 14th. Uh, and so we need to hear from communities of faith uh, around the plan for our country moving forward. What does Dr. Uh, Berg, I wanna pause you there. We, we, we public comments, but how, what does that look like for me? So I'm a, I'm an everyday parishioner. How do I get involved in that public comment? Sure, so if you go to www.federalregistry.gov uh, and search the HIV plan, uh, it will take you to where you can online uh, give your public comments until December 14th. Uh, as a member of- Say that one more time for us, slowly. www.federalregistry.gov. Uh, and I imagine if you just do a Google search of uh, the HIV plan 2021 to 2025 um, public comments, then it'll take you to a site. But we need to that our government needs to hear from us uh, about what we need to see in that strategy as communities of faith so that we can continue to keep to our promise to end HIV and AIDS as a public health crisis by the year 2030. Thank you so much for that. And um, I, I want to just thank our panelists so much um, for you all lending your expertise. And we now want to, uh, we've been having a, a live Q&A, but it's my understanding we're going to just switch it now to make sure that we're addressing our, our, our live Q&A. And, um, and this, we, I want to open this up to Dr. Wallace as well and, and others in, in terms of experts. Um, Reverend Stacy, did you want me to continue um, in, the, in the live Q&A? Yes, sir. Okay, and so one of the questions we had, um, and, and Dr. Bailey, I'm actually going to st start with you on this, um, is that one of the panelists wanted to know about what are we doing in the faith community 
through this, again, this concept of intersectionality and the role of how we're engaging LGBTQ communities. I know um, I'm, you know, very fortunate to be a part of the United Churches of Christ and, you know, having grown up, grown up in certain things where we can, many of us come to this experience in religious trauma and then being able to find the, the UCC community can be very aff affirming. But, you know, what are other things that you all, are, that you've seen, Dr. Burley, in how faith communities are bridging this space between um, the sometimes specific needs of LGBTQ communities? Yeah, let me first say that uh, I don't want to speak on behalf of the LGBTQ community in terms of what their needs are uh, as a, a cis uh, hetero uh, sexual male. Uh, however, I can express what I've seen from my yes. perspective. Uh, and uh, I have seen uh, progress uh, in our faith communities in terms of um, inclusion. Um, however, I want to note that inclusion and affirmation are not the same thing. Um, inclusion and acceptance are not the same thing. Um, and so uh, we have to begin to move from a place of uh, everybody is welcome. Uh, to a place of everybody is welcome to participate in the worship experience wholly. And that's as pastor, that's as deacon, that's as choir director, uh, that's as parishioner, right? And so uh, we're at a place where a lot of our churches are, are, are what they call open, um, but they're not as affirming as they say that they are, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you, can, you can come in, but sit in the corner or don't ask to be a part of uh, the forward-facing worship uh, or otherwise. And so definitely still some work to be done, uh, but I'm encouraged uh, by fellowships like the UCC, uh, my own Evangelical Lutheran Church uh, in America and others um, that have uh, now uh, affirmed uh, the leadership and pastorship uh, of same gender loving uh, persons um, through, through ordination um, that also acknowledge um, same gender unions uh, as marriage uh, in their churches. And so this is progress, uh, but uh, we're definitely not there yet. And the church is just a reflection of the larger society. Um, you know, it's not church and society, it's church and society, right? Uh, and so uh, my hope is that as society continues to um, move closer to a more perfect union, and that is where um, all identities uh, are, are, are loved and valued and everybody has full access to, to human rights. Um, that our churches will too. I would much rather our churches be out front on this um, because that's how it's been in the past, right? Churches led and then society followed. Um, not so much on this issue, but I'm encouraged um, by the work that I've uh, been able to do and continue to do uh, and making sure that the lived experiences of uh, both sexual and, gen sexual and gender minorities uh, are um, affirmed uh, and not just accepted and not just included uh, in our faith spaces. And so again, we talk about reimagining sacred texts uh, and, uh, you know, in our Christian, uh, Judeo-Christian uh, tradition, uh, making sure that, uh, you know, we preach the gospel. The gospel is very clear uh, about how Jesus feels about all people. Uh, and I think if we just preach the gospel, uh, that we'd be all right. Uh, but oftentimes we uh, we uh, we 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 stray from that, uh, and the same is true for when we talk about social justice and where its place is in our faith uh, and otherwise. And so, um, definitely, still much work to be done uh, in that regard, uh, and I'm sure others have uh, uh, commented and feedback as well. But I've been encouraged um, in my short time in doing this work uh, by the progress that has. Well, th thank you for that. And I, I was very intentional in actually calling on you in your role, not to speak for, but I think we have to be conscious of this concept yeah. of ally, because yeah. oftentimes we, 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 we put more trauma on, on, on certain communities by having us be the only one speaking up for ourselves, right? Absolutely. And so women's right issues are just as much a black man's issues as they are in, in my issues. issues. In my issues. That's right. Yeah. So yeah. that's I, it was intentionality in having in having you open up on that. And okay. and Dr. Cersei, you 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 talked you uh, talked about this comment of affirming, and you said yes. From a clinical mental health perspective, why is this concept of affirmation or affirming? I, I saw you in one of the books behind you. I am enough, right? Yes. 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 You know. <laughs> 
why why is that important why is it important for me to know that i am enough during this time yeah i mean it's very important i mean it's the basic need that we all need and just throw in you know if i'm on the lgbt tqaa spectrum you know it's one thing to acknowledge right one thing to say i accept but really affirming or that affirmation is a different piece where you know in my practice i have uh signage up, you know, affirming is just a whole nother level and being able to really apply not only acknowledging, but accepting, but everything, right? And it's just important to the core of a person, right? Um, so that's why I just said, yes, I really, <laughs> I was like, yes, affirming, yes. And I think, you know, just in the church, you know, we will, I'm from Mississippi. So in Mississippi, we're more conservative. It's just a different level, right? And I think the church as a whole, uh, African-American church, we we have some ways to go with mm -hmm. uh, this population. I could just say that. Do I have the answers? No, but put me at the table, please. And I can help, <laughs> right? right. So. Put me in coach. <laughs> <laughs> and and Miss Smith, you Southside Health Center has been at the forefront of advocating for, for our communities. Can you talk a little bit about you all's work, particularly in, in this area of affirming and advocating for such and gender minority communities? Well, certainly, you know, I just want to go circle back to the church, you know, and what they can do. You know, affirming is definitely um, uh, a plus, yes. Uh, but certainly, I think that, you know, from the leadership standpoint, I think it's important for the leadership of the church to correct people when they are not as affirming or when they're saying discouraging remarks against uh, members of the LGBT community. Uh, uh, so I, I think it's, you know, just important for, you know, the church to be responsible in terms of, of speaking out against things that are, are false and falsehoods uh, about, um, you know, COVID as well as members of the LGBT community. Uh, you know, certainly we try our best, uh, uh, you know, when my mother started the organization, uh, to really create programs and systems uh, that would affirm uh, uh, the LGBT community, and we continue to strive that, and that's kind of reflective in our um, in our in our staff, uh, and so we we do our best, uh, uh, and and certainly uh, we we uh, again hire uh, members from the LGBT community to serve the LGBT community. And so um, I'm very uh, uh, pleased with uh, the leadership within our organization and how they reach out um, uh, and serve uh, and serve our community. So yeah. Thank you so much for that. And um, I, I want to just give uh, Dr. Wallace, that, not to put you on the spot, but give you give you a space. You you gave us a great presentation. And and in terms of this concept of data, I I, I love data. And, so, and and when it's sometimes garbage in, garbage out. So sometimes the, the the data we put out is is only as good as the data we we collect, right? So what is the message you want to leave our our attendees and our listeners with in in terms of why it's important for them to be counted as a as a epidemiologist and someone in, in the data space, we, we were really advocating for the U.S. Census, the importance of being counted. Can, can you just leave us with the importance of, of, of why it's important for us to be at the table, whether it's at the table for testing, at the table for clinical trials, and the design dissemination? Why do we need to be in that number? Sure. Uh, thank you for that. Um, I, I think that there are a few reasons why it's important for us to be counted. And I think chiefly among them is, is we have a lot of work to do in our communities uh, to respond to the various uh, health conditions, um, uh, um, uh, generational trauma. There's a lot of work to do in our communities to respond to the things that, are, that we're experiencing on a day-to-day -day basis. And certainly, many of us want to hold accountable the systems that have perpetuated these traumas. And one of the most effective ways to do that is to have data, recognizing that policy cannot change without numbers to correlate or to match what the impact or what's actually happening. And so when you think about not just at the federal level, right, not just at the White House, not just within Congress, but even within our, our counties, even within our cities and our states, the data 
on any particular issue is going to help drive the conversation. And where we are not at the table, I like to say we are on the menu. That's and right. so it's critical that we are at the table, we're counted and that we're represented. Um, it is time out for us to continue to sort of sit back and allow systems to continue as they are and allow this society to continue um, as it's been. And we have this to me, and I, I've shared this with others, including Dr. Burley, that to me, this pandemic has completely underscored that not just the possibility, but the reality of what it means when we commune, when we convene, when we get together, when we organize, when we articulate a position and we communicate that and we assemble and, and, um, and, uh, and advocate for that position. Um, we've seen that with the shift in conversation regarding black lives in this country. And I think that we have an opportunity to continue this momentum to ensure that other policy considerations and other important factors and, and issues in our communities continue to be elevated, continue to be addressed and discussed. Thank you so much. And again, I wanna thank all of our panelists um, for your work. I wanna thank um, all of our presenters to date. And, and I also wanna thank McCormick for, for creating a space and a place for this conversation to take place. I don't want that to be lost on, on our community and our, and our attendees and our, our audience that we have this training space that McCormick has created this space and place. And that gives me so much hope of, of that, that we are, have a space where leaders can be trained in this space. And so there's been comments in the chat about how can you get more information on the You Be The Cure work that Dr. Burley is doing. His website is youbethecure.com. And I believe that McCormick and the, the, the organizing committee is gonna make a lot of these comments public and you'll be able to get access to them um, later on. So I wanna turn it back over to now to Reverend, Stace, Reverend Dr. Stacey Edwards Dunn. But again, I wanna thank you all for your time um, and space and thank you for being present and, and, your, and your role in doing this work today. God bless us all. Thank you so much, Dr. Kareem Watson, Ms. Vanessa Smith, Dr. Burley, uh, as well as uh, Dr. Steven, Stefan Wallace, as well as Dr. Uh, Searcy Pate. We just thank you for your time, um, your expertise, sharing your expertise, your wisdom um, uh, with us on this day. Um, I just pray that God continues to bless each of your, the work of your hands and your heart and your souls as you forge forward to continue to impact the community in even greater ways than you already have. So thank you again for being with us. We also again thank Dr. Watson for being our moderator this year. Um, it's good to have you back. And we thank also our entire committee who helped to put our summit together this year. Thank you all. Um, you all are always so committed and dedicated to the summit and we are grateful for each one of you. We also say thank you to uh, Reverend Priscilla Rodriguez. Um, she always helps to hold us all together and also to the entire media team, our tech team, um, Mrs. Barbara Fassett, as well as Richard Mayo. We thank you for all that you did to ensure that our program today was a success. We all have some, uh, some work to do. There's work for each one of us to do in our own places as we uh, move ahead and let us take heed and um, be honest with ourselves about what we can do and whatever it is that we can do in our own places, individually as well as collectively, let's do it so that we can continue to raise awareness and also support those who are living with HIV and AIDS um, during this pandemic and beyond the pandemic as well. Um, today, we also take the time to remember those persons who have transitioned through the veil of time as a result of HIV and AIDS, uh, and also any other illness as well. Um, if you know anyone, wherever you're seating, we invite you even to call their names right now. And as you call their names, we say Ashe, as we remember them as they are our great ancestors and amongst that great cloud of witnesses who are encouraging us to do this work, but also um, 
leading us um, forward as well. Again, we say thank you. We don't want to keep you too much longer. We know that every day people are uh, on Zoom and we are probably Zoomed out. And so, um, but we do know that this was some great information and um, we hope that each one of us are the better because of what we have experienced in these last two and a half hours. Please mark your calendars. We'll be right back here next year, um, first Saturday in December, whether in person, depending on where we are in the midst of this pandemic. If we're not in person, um, we will be back in this digital space, continuing to raise awareness and um, around HIV and AIDS. Please be safe please make sure we are wearing our mask. If you don't have a mask, let somebody know so that we can support you and get you some masks. Let's make sure we are washing our hands, limiting um, our exposure, um, not having a whole bunch of gatherings so that we're exposing ourselves. Make sure you're exercising, um, pouring good foods in your body as much as possible, drinking lots of water and also um, taking care of your mental and spiritual and emotional health. All of these are important as well to help us to fight off and to deal with this um, pandemic and navigate um, during this pandemic and ultimately to keep safe and to remain healthy. Um, as we prepare, I think Dr. Uh, I mean, David Crawford is still on the line. And so we say thank you again, uh, David Crawford for your support, President Crawford for your support. I saw a few of the other staff and faculty on the line, and we say thank you to you all for uh, supporting the summit again this year. As we prepare to go, I leave you with this benediction that says, may the Lord bless you and may the Lord keep you. Make God's face shine upon you and be gracious unto each one of you until we meet again. Go in peace. Have a wonderful day and God bless you. And we all say together, amen. Amen. Thank you. Thanks. Thank Rep. you. Thank you all. Thanks, Bye -bye. everybody.